Yes, everyone. Do you know what time it is? It's your boy Jack here, joined by Dave, and we're going to be bringing you the new edition of the podcast from last week, and we're going to be talking about basically the brand new announcement made by Tottenham Hotspur having to do with the Formula One making a 15-year deal with the likes of Tottenham Hotspur, and we're going to take a big dive into it because it has sort of set the fan base alight for maybe good reasons, bad reasons, and also just to be honest, just kind of promotes, you know, good discussion based on the future of the club as well as like where the club's priorities are you know and all that sort of good stuff and everybody if you do enjoy these sort of podcasts if you do enjoy these sort of maybe kind of chill discussions between dave and myself as if it were almost like a phone call of some kind feel free to hit that like button please maybe let's try to get this to 100 likes if we can everybody that would be absolutely massive but dave how are we yeah jack i'm in a good mood i mean how can you not be in a good mood after beating the bubble merchants and the flower enthusiasts back to back london derby victories and uh, look, you know, I'm looking forward to tomorrow as well. Uh, the pressures of the Premier League is off us and we're in the FA Cup, which I feel is a bit more of a sort of like a carnival atmosphere, which I enjoy. So, by the way, stay tuned for the pre-match pump up and the watch along tomorrow. Of course, every game day, all day is dedicated to the game. So make sure you tune into the Irish Hotspur for all your game day action. But Jack, we do have some things to talk about today. Um, and it is the Formula One sponsorship that has been announced now there there are some I, i'm going to be honest for me personally i think there's some positives towards it and there are some maybe criticisms that i've picked out that i think are just unfair so look let's read out the statement and then let's get into it i'm going to read out the statement to everybody and then i'm also going to read out you know some of the you know the key details you could say uh, from the likes of football london of course but tottenham Hotspur have announced a 15-year strategic partnership with formula one the agreement will see the world's first in-stadium electric karting facility in london's longest indoor track based below the south stand at tottenham hotspur stadium the new facility which is due to open in autumn 2023 will include separate tracks for both adults as well as juniors it has been a Credited by the National Karting Association, making the facility a potential future revenue for National Karting Championship races, everybody. The new experience will also include interactive motorsport activities and food and beverage facilities, of course. It will also add to the range of activities at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium with the Dare Skywalk apparently proving to be a big hit in the capital, according to <laughs> according to Football London. Uh, Tottenham have also confirmed that the karting experience will be the focal point of the long-term relationship between the club and Formula One that will aim to create apprenticeship and career opportunities for local young people, everybody, and bring greater diversity to the motorsport industry in general. A, dr a driver academy program will also help increase the motorsport talent pool and possibly help to identify the next generation of Formula One drivers. Levy had some quotes on all of this, and he said, since building the stadium, our ambition has always been to see how far we can push the boundaries in delivering world-class experiences that will attract people from around the world all year round. He went on further to explain to the club's official website, saying that we have been able to bring the biggest names in sport and entertainment to London N17. We are extremely excited about what this long-term partnership with Formula One will bring to our global national as well as local communities and so dave i have a you know a question i think we're going to go down a lot of different you know sort of rabbit holes and kind of discussion mm -hmm. points so everybody just sort of you know brace yourself for maybe what could be a bit of a you know a big conversation here and you know it might not be the most organized but i imagine we'll get to some sort of you know good answer as well to some sort of good discussion mm -hmm. on it but lots of positive is negative reactions to all of this of course dave and uh plenty have of course mocked even this announcement with the age-old mockages of uh another one for for the trophy cabinet and uh i think another one of my favorites has been you know spurs sign formula one but can he actually play at center back are all about twitter i feel like at the moment and in all seriousness though i feel like the question still remains that does this benefit tottenham hotspur on the football pitch or is this maybe just another money-making scheme for enoch to line their own pockets look jack it's one of them that i think unless you keep an eye on where the where the uh, profits generated from these activities actually go into, and you have a, a detail, an account detail by detail of exactly how they process that money into Tottenham Hotspur Football Club, and how that money then affects transfer budgets and stuff like that, which is the whole idea is supposed to help plump it up so that we can attract better players to this football club. I think you'll never really truly under you'll never truly really get the answer to that question. But look. 
Me personally, Jack, I actually have no problems with Tottenham creating revenue streams that are not solely reliant on income from football matches, tickets, beer, food, merchandise, TV revenue. I actually think it's a good thing as long as the money to build it, you know, that it does not affect transfer budgets, which then has an impact on the football pitch, which is what Tottenham Hotspur fans ultimately care about. They don't care about any of this other stuff going on around. They ultimately care about what's going on on the football pitch. So as long as the profits generated from this in the future go back into the football side of things and we see it replicated on the pitch, yeah, I, I actually have no problems with it. Um, now, there are some criticisms, like I said, which I'll get onto further on. But I do, I do think it is yeah. important to maybe touch on the first part of the statement, Jack, or, or the first part that maybe I want to touch on, which is the actual benefits to the local community, because I sure. don't think that should get lost with everything else that we're going to speak about next. Yeah, I feel like when it comes to the local community, everybody, it might be important just to bring out some of those quotes. And also, again, they kind of you know brought this up here, saying that Tottenham have confirmed that the carding experience will be a focal point for a long-term partnership between the club and Formula One that will aim to create apprenticeship as well as career opportunities for local young people and bring greater diver diversity to the motorsport industry in general. And they're even creating a driver academy program at Spurs, which will also help increase the motorsport talent pool, they're saying. So it's basically not just, you know, a place for people to have a nice day out, you know, just ride some carts around the track. It's actually even also going to maybe sort of be, you could say, a place for people in the local London area, especially that local North London area who might actually never really have had maybe the previous opportunities or the previous access, you could say, or even privileges, you know, to be able to access that type of, you know, facility, access that type of resources to be able to do, you know, Formula One or be able to do motorsport in general, right? Let's say, Dave, you had, you know, a hobby, a passion like that, that of course, you know, requires a lot of, you know, extra moving parts and everything. It's not like, you know, a football that you could just, you know, go over to your local park or anything like that. You know, it is, you know, a, a hobby and, you know, it is a passion of people's that requires a lot of moving parts for it. And it feels like, you know, maybe people who do live in, you know, kind of inner city as well as maybe urban areas. It's not always the case that you really just see motorsport, you know, kind of tracks just, you know, mm -hmm. right, uh, you know, around your local street corner. And it looks like maybe this could actually be, you know, an opportunity for the local community to be able to access it, you know, for maybe a day off or, you know, maybe a time when actually uh, they're just looking for something to do. But it's not even just that. It's not even just like a local activity for people in the area. It's actually going to be serving as a place for maybe younger generations of people who might be really into motorsports, might be really into Formula One, who might have never been able to soup, you know, get into that sort of sport, be able to get into that sort of hobby. And now they kind of can through that sort of apprenticeship program, those, you know, career opportunities that they brought up as well. So I feel like that sort of stuff you can't really get too angry about. And in fact, it almost seems like kind of a good thing at the end of the day, because I also wanted to say too, that compared to the, all the other revenue streams, like Beyonce concerts, NFL games and things like that, I would say this one is probably a bit more kind of, you know, uh, I would say has a bit more touch to the lo local community than some of the other revenue streams that they do. You could say some of the other revenue streams that they have, like the NFL and whatnot, are probably a bit more self-interested, for lack of a better term, probably a bit more se self-interested, you know, kind of revenue streams. Whereas this one, let's be honest, it has more, you know, benefit to the local community as well as for future generations of the local community than maybe, you know, other revenue streams like Beyonce concerts and the NFL. Look, Joe, I think that's actually a key point, the fact that the NFL, you know, the rugby league that comes there, the Beyonce concerts, the boxing, you know, things like that, that come to the stadium. The only way people really benefit in Tottenham from that is maybe the, the shops. They might generate a bit more revenue that day, et cetera. If Some they of the happen to be a fan of it. Hotspur, but it's yeah. mainly self-interest. It's mainly the money is going into Tottenham Hotspur, um, itself, so it's not really benefiting the lo the wider community too much. Whereas this one, actually, it does benefit the wider community. You know, look when you look at Tottenham Hotspur, we are in the heart of Tottenham Hotspur. We are along the main road, along the high road of Tottenham Hotspur. We are sunk right into the community. And I think a good football community, a good football club, does look to help the wider community around it. You know, look to. Yeah 
help them grow and stuff like that. So I think, you know, I do think that's a good thing that it, it, this one, like you said, is more serve, it is looking to offer the, the community things. And what I mean by that is yeah. it creates employment opportunities, apprenticeship opportunities and career prospects for the people of Tottenham. And and my 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 biggest thing on this, they have to go to the people that taught them. I don't want them to go to anybody outside traveling in because it's a well paid job, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's got to go to the people that taught them, and I think it's good because it creates employment, it, 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 yeah. it, which then you know helps the local com- local eco- local economy because right. you need more money in the local com- uh, economy in the community because it's being spent there, right? apprenticeships i think it's great for young people apprenticeships you know because me personally jack i wasn't the most academic in school but i'm good with my hands and there are people out there like that school doesn't cater to people like that right and apprenticeships are great for young people like like me who maybe are not like what you would call book smart but more hands-on it's good for them it creates a good um opportunity and a way out for them as well um you know any young person that maybe live around the area that look, maybe don't like football, but exactly. you know, they they do they do like watching Formula One, but then they're sitting there going, Well, you know, we can never get into that because look, let's face it, Formula One is is a money is a money sport. It more cares to the elite. It's only the elite that can really afford it. They go to the most expensive cities across the world. They or like I even said, like there's no the Formula One facilities that or motorsport facilities that I know of in any city of any kind. They're always kind of maybe more in the rural areas or more mm-hmm. in kind of areas where there's a bit more space for that kind of thing. And sometimes people just happen to be born, you know, maybe uh, like a kind of an urban sort of area where there isn't even the space for that kind of thing. And Spurs mm-hmm. have found a way to put it underground and everything for that type of you know opportunity which i'll be honest i haven't even heard of something like that you know an indoor kind of facility underground you know like that as well and that's the thing right is it's giving opportunities to people who maybe as well just just happen by you know by by circumstance just happen to be born in places where it's just not really easy to have that sort of space for that kind of thing i think also golf can be one of those sports too like sometimes it's hard even i love golf dave and it was hard to you know could be a good golfer it was hard to even do golf at all like since i grew up in the city and everything you know there are no golf courses you know right around the corner or anything like that and so you only got to do it so often and you then fell behind and you kind of had to like put put that like sort of hobby or whatever to the side and it feels like maybe people have had maybe to do that with formula one or motorsport that maybe grew up in the city or something like that right that they had to put those hobbies to the side never felt like they really got the opportunity to do it and now this is the time to do it and just quickly as well because i know i interrupted you but like it feels like i know spurs do really sometimes maybe don't do the best job with maybe their sort of local reputation as well as their kind of local sort of, let's say, standing, you know, with their neighbors and whatnot. And that's what I meant by how the NFL and Beyonce concerts, let's be honest, are probably let's more of a nuisance, I would guess, like for kind of the neighbors and whatnot with all the traffic, all the people kind of coming in all of a sudden late at night, as well as maybe all the noise that comes from it too, right? Maybe late at night, whereas something like this could be a local activity for people on a day off, but also serve as, like you said, like apprenticeships, job opportunities, those sort of things, which I think would have a you know, give Spurs a better reputation and a better standing in the local community as well. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. But as well, like what, what I was going to get at as well is sure. look, be a Formula One driver. It takes a lot of money, Jack. You look at you, you look at uh, a lot of Formula One drivers. You look right. at the background. They come from parents that are very wealthy that right. have a lot of money to put in the sport because you have to travel all over the world. You have to get your car or all over the world to be able to compete in these competitions to try and win sponsorships to try and one day you know hopefully get taken on by a formula one team so it Uh costs an awful lot of money and you know the the reality is with the way the world is jack is you know one percent of people can really afford to do that the others can't really afford to do that so you know by by having this there it gives them the opportunity to develop and 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 and, and um, you know apply apply their skills and then hopefully get picked up or sponsored mm. by somebody or put in front of an eye where maybe they may not have had that before so it does create maybe an alternative career for somebody in and around that area which I think is is absolutely fantastic 
And lastly, another thing is I think it's very good for the young people, Jack, because, look, you know, all over the world you've got, you know, especially in big cities, right, you've got a lot of trouble, a lot of, a lot of crime, this, that, and the other. And it's kind of like mo most of it is generated out of boredom because there's nothing for right. kids to do, for young people to do. So the more activities that there is for these for these younger kids to do, the less likely they are to get involved in the sort of, you know, misdemeanors, crime, being a nuisance, etc. So I think it does serve its purpose in that regard to the local community. But I do think it's important that Tottenham don't lose sight that, you know, they've got to keep it affordable, affordable to the people that right. they're trying to pitch this to. You know, they're, they're put, pitching it across as it's good for the wider community. So the trick is, and the key is, and the main thing is, they've got to keep it affordable to these for people. everyone. Not go in the way Formula One prices uh, direction is going. They've got to keep it, look, um, you know, affordable to the people and accessible to the people in the local community yeah. if, if it's to benefit the local community the way they say it is. And I think the overall point that we're trying to make here about the, the benefits of the local community is, is that sort of some people have said in the past, like, I really don't have much issue with the NFL game. Seems like a great way for the club to make money. Or some people have said, right, don't have much of an issue with the concerts. Seems like a great way to make money. I would make the case that this is less contentious. This is less of maybe, a, like I brought up before, for lack of a better term, this is less of a self-interested sort of kind of money revenue stream than maybe the other ones are. And so if you were to maybe be upset about the ways that the club are kind of, you know, maybe trying to make it more like an entertainment complex, et cetera, I would say this one seems to have some more sort of positive lights to it. It's more positive sort of kind of, you know, notions to it that maybe the NFL games do and, you know, the team shop becoming an NFL shop or like the Beyonce concerts and things like that, because this does seem to have at least the the standings and the foundations of a, a long lasting sort of relationship with the local community. And I don't know if that was really the case exactly with the other revenue streams and whatnot. So I feel like if you were to be upset with, the diverse revenue streams. And I think we're going to get into that as to why people would be upset with it. I would maybe make the case and people can welcome to disagree me. Feel free to do it in the comments, everybody. But I feel like this one would be one that's, you know, has a bit more complicated, you know, not as black and white, you know, it feels like this one is a bit more beneficial to the local community than the other revenue streams. I just, that they have. I just want to highlight as well that we fully understand, obviously, the money that it's and we're not from the local community the so we can't speak for them either then. no no but i, I, I want to point this out like we're well aware that there is self-interest in this for the club in terms sure. of money revenue etc cetera, etc cetera. but the point we're trying to make is that this one does give back a little compared to other ones yes well said dave well said dave and uh, i know we have some other points that we actually want to get on this like one mm -hmm. of the things i wanted to even say too though was that does this really come as a surprise, right? Because after maybe Daniel Levy made his, you know, uh, made his summary of his accounts that were released just recently, uh, he did make, you know, plenty of statements and plenty of, you know, kind of points towards like, you know, they're, you know, maybe searching for bigger revenue streams, more diverse revenue streams, I believe was, you know, the quote, in fact, that they had used when they also responded to the, to, to the supporters trust, you know, Daniel Levy said that, the diverse revenue streams are going to be a way for the club to be able to increase its transfer budget, but also still allow it to do what it always has wanted to do, which is operate well within its means. But that's the thing where maybe people get a little bit caught up on is because they feel like the club could take more risks. They feel like the club could maybe not try to operate as much within its means, especially with all these new sponsorships, right, Dave? Is that when you keep getting all these new deals in and when you keep kind of, you know, uh, taking away from some of the, you know, stuff on the football pitch, you'd like to think that this man means that, they spend more generously, they would spend more freely and whatnot. But a lot of people, I would kind of say rightfully so, have some skeptic have some skepticism about that and also are a bit maybe uh, wary about whether this will actually get put all back into the football club, all back into the football pitch, maybe to be more specific. So mm -hmm. where do you stand on this, Dave? Because like I pointed out, I don't know if this is exactly in a surprise that Daniel Levy has some new revenue stream lined up. Like he did say that they were going to be kind of ramping that up a little bit. But at the same time, the question always does remain. 
is this actually going to go back into the football pitch? Is this going to go back into the transfer budget? Look, I don't think anyone would be a surprise to anyone, whether you're Enoch in, Enoch out. I, I don't think it'd be a surprise to anyone. You know, the club always announced sponsorship deals. I think people are well accustomed to that. But, Jack, the reality is, right, money in football is absolutely crazy right now. Mm. Transfer fees are through the roof. Wages are through the roof. Agent fees are through the roof. Yeah. Um, match day revenue, ticket revenue, merch, TV money. It's just not enough to compete in European football or even in our own domestic league anymore, if you want me to be brutally honest. And, yeah. it, it, you know, if we're being realistic with it, winning the Premier League, Champions League usually meant that you could go big in the transfer market, gaining an advantage from the prize money that you've earned. Um, but the reality is, again, not even winning that. You know, gives mm. you that advantage in the transfer market anymore. You've got teams in a relegation fight that spend more than the prize money of a Champions League or winning the Premier League. They got four League. assigning Kaylor Navas, a Champions League winner. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's it's sort of like, so, you know, the, the what I'm getting at is the money from football generated income is no longer enough or just enough to rely on to be able to compete with the likes of a Man City, with the likes of a Chelsea, who are owned by, like Man City, by owned by a wealthy state. You know, the guy at Chelsea, money is no object to him. Newcastle United, owned by a wealthy state. Man United have always had a massive, you know, sort of generation, um, um, money generated uh, coming into their club. So the reality is, if we want to compete with them, we can no longer just rely on, on, on uh, football revenue that's generated by the football so we do have to have other ways of generating that money and i think somewhere along the line whether we like it or not jack i think we have to get on board or accept that this is the way forward for tottenham hotspur by bringing yeah. in revenue that's not solely reliant on the football and the reason why i say that is if we want our club to spend money so we can compete for honours domestically and in Europe on a regular basis going forward from now, we need them extra revenue streams, especially yeah, exactly. if we don't want to sell up or change the way they operate. And if we're stuck with them, this is the way we have to go with it. Yeah. But having said all that, as fans, we do need to keep a much closer eye on the money generated from these revenue streams and find out exactly if that money is going on uh, onto the pitch, as we were told, because this is the whole idea behind it. But the reality is, if Ina can leave, you're going nowhere. And and because the, the football money that we generate through competitions and TV yeah. revenue and match day, it, it's no longer sufficient to help us compete in the transfer market, because like I said, with the wages, agent fees and, and, and uh, transfer fees skyrocketing, we we have to accept this that we have to have other other revenue coming in to to be able to, yeah. to compete and that's the part i think you know that i would absolutely take out of that so much good that so many good things that you said there but part i would take out of that is that regardless seeing again levy out if you find yourself sort of still stuck with them like what we all need to then be paying attention to together sort of as a fan base is like, is this really going back into the transfer budget? Is this really going back into it? Because some people who might be super, you know, kind of uh, uh, detailed and super kind of, you know, focused on where the money is going, you know, will be looking at it. People who might not be as focused on it still would like to hope and still would like to think that it is going straight back into the transfer budget. Cause what is the point of lining your own pockets with things like that? Because even if you don't feel as passionate about the owners, why would you want to see that them lining their own pockets, you know, with that type of a, uh, that type of revenue stream and whatnot, you would like to think that this does contribute back into the football pitch, that this does mean that, you know, we can revamp the back line more that we can revamp other areas of the squad sooner rather than later. And so absolutely Dave, I do feel like, if you do find yourself sort of stuck with Levy and Enoch even further, it is up to us to sort of, you know, may, pay attention here as to, you know, is this really going back into it? And it's only just recently since, you know, the ending of COVID, which is crazy to even say, I think still, right? Like sort of kind of post-COVID era, it's now like these sort of revenue streams post-COVID era 
starting to flow in a bit more because things are opening up again, sort of businesses, you know, despite inflation and whatnot, are more willing to invest because they know that there are more, you know, butts being put in seats right now and all that sort of stuff. And people are more, you know, out and about doing activities and going to pubs, doing, you know, sort of things on their day off, like we said before. And it's kind of now where it spurs are starting to see the benefits of all these different revenue streams that they actually really didn't in the COVID era. And that's something we probably forget because COVID honestly, and the, the impacts of it on football specifically were so long and everlasting that now we're starting to see spurs really dip into these revenue streams and really start to kind of open themselves up a bit more. And I'll be honest, I think it's only getting started. I think it's only getting started. Like, I think we're only going to get even more, you know, from here on out, but this is one that, I would say I'm not going to get as worked up about as maybe uh, as maybe others would, you know, as maybe other fans would, or even just in general. I just don't think this is as sinister or as a uh, yeah as sinister as a self interested of a you know partnership or as of a of a sponsorship as maybe other ones that they've maybe done in the past might be. Uh, so that's how I sort of see it. But I don't know, Dave. Maybe any other sort of points that you want to make on it, especially maybe the fact that I did know that you made that point where it's like if you are stuck with them, the more revenue streams there are, the more diverse revenue streams are. Ultimately, you like to think then the more money there is, and the more money there is for them to dip into it. And of course, we like them to be able to dip into their own pockets a bit more but it doesn't seem like that's how they go and so that then means if they are going to continue to work their the same way the more revenue streams there are theoretically the more money there is actually to to dip into too and look that's the key point i was trying to get to jack i think you summarized it perfectly there that look we we the reality is we don't have owners that are willing to dip their hands into their pocket and fund this club like a man city owner like the Chelsea owner, for example. So, you know, if we have to, because, you know, at the end of the day, it's up to them if they want to sell or not. So if they have no intention of selling, we have to stick with them, then we have to have other ways of earning the revenue. And then that way, then there should be no excuses for us not to compete if mm. if all these revenues go onto the football pitch, right? But, you know, saying that, although I think it, it is something that we, we have to accept, there are some things off the back of it that, I understand and maybe I'm getting a little bit concerned by it. There's two things. The first one is, is that fans are starting to become concerned that our home, our sacred turf, it's not a football stadium anymore. And it's a, hmm. a multi-sports entertainment arena or a tourist attraction. And it's starting to make fans disillusioned or distant from the football club because maybe the football club doesn't share the same ambition or aim as them or what they were used to seeing growing up which and for me I think look it does expand all generations but I think I definitely see sort of an older generation sort of becoming disillusioned because right. you and I, I, I want to make this clear. I don't think people should ridicule these people or, you know, dismiss it as them being childish because it's not. I think you, what, what you should do is actually try and understand where they're coming from. and Put yourself in their shoes. Because, Jack, these are people that we, that have, they've seen this, this, this club pick up a couple of trophies every single decade. Right. And under this ownership, they're seeing that slip further and further and further away, Right. And we've got to understand that these are people that when the football club was reliant on fan income and football income, they kept this club afloat. afloat. They paved the way for me and you to be able to support this football club here today. They're part of why it's there for us to support today. They handed this football club down to us. Exactly. And I do think I do think that the club need to do more to try and communicate with these fans. And they can do that in a number of ways, Jack, where they can, you know maybe put out their vision a lot more clearly, state it a lot more clearly, you know, and be a bit more ambitious in the transfer market to show that they do care about winning trophies because that's what we all want at the end of the day. Yeah, of course. But someone like me and you, because of the way football is changing, I'm a bit younger, I can, and I haven't grown up watching Tottenham win a couple of trophies every single decade. I can sort of understand why we need to generate the extra revenue that we do, but I can also understand why other people don't 
don't accept it or don't understand it or don't want to understand it or accept exactly. it. I can, also, I can also understand that because they grew up watching this club win a couple of trophies every decade, regardless of how football changed when they were growing up. I think it's important, like you said, Dave, to put yourself in their shoes, the the the, the older <laughs> fans, the the more seasoned and veteran fans uh, of, uh, of Spurs, because when you really look at maybe especially someone like myself, quite a young fan, like it's probably quite easy for me to accept these sort of changes, these sort of announcements, this sort of, you know, way of the modern game, which is nation states owning clubs, 400 million pound transfers on players, right? Like all these big brand sponsor deals and stuff like that. These are things that let's be honest, everybody, like I have sort of kind of grown up with slash maybe don't even have much of a picture of what it is other than this sort of kind of, you know, reality in this sort of situation. Whereas the older legacy fans, they were able to see, you know, maybe when, you know, clubs weren't, you know, seeing M&M ads or, you know, Nike ads being flashed across, you know, the sidelines. Or they also even as well, lots of fans, Dave, even go way back to when kits didn't even have last names or surnames on the back of, you know, uh, the kits. It was just a number on the back of the kit as well. There wasn't as much individuality when it came to sports. There were no, you know, Neymars about and everything with big, you know, hairdos and tattoos as, you know, big, uh, you know, names on the back of their kits and whatnot. That was also, you know, a big change. And so you have to, I do think, look at their shoes and see how maybe changes have been have been coming to football and they have had to take every single change and have had to live with it and as well as you know sort of adapt to it themselves and I think it's a bit easier said than done to sort of tell them to move on and live with it and you know just grow up you know you know kind of thing because let's be honest I think it's easier for someone like me to sort of handle these sort of changes than it is for them because they've had to see the game basically turn from one reality to a completely different reality than you know what it probably used to look like you know the modern it was games. more about the football wasn't it more exactly than finances. Right. now finances play as much uh, if not more important role than the actual football itself because you need the finances to be able to do the football right so it's kind of like the game has changed like that but exactly i just think it's a crying shame you know i do see more and more fans being disillusioned and driven away and i do think that's something that the club need to accept and acknowledge and, and maybe do more to maybe, you know, communicate with these fans. And look, that brings me on to uh, a couple of other points. But, you know, one thing is, is like a lot of the fans are getting disillusioned that it's not a, not a stadium anymore, right? It's more turning into uh, a multi-sports complex slash entertainment center right and it's kind of like how do i put it that do they have to do it that way right it, like they're 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 very ingenuitive about coming up with the ideas for instance building the go kart track underneath the south stand and bringing formula one to tottenham so could they not do that in other ways like they've already done shirt sleeve sponsors training gear sponsors could they not sell the name and rights to the training ground, can they not come up with other ways of doing it that doesn't actually affect the stadium? Because what what I think, to me, me personally, I go to the football stadium for the football, and that's what I want to go to. I want a dedicated home to football only because it's an escapism, right? You get away from everything. You're in your home with many people that think like you. You go away to escape your problems, this, that, and the other. The last thing you want to do and, and you go there because you're proud. It's a tribal thing. The last thing you want to do is go there. And you've got all these other events going on. It's kind of like you just want the football and football only. So I wonder is like rather than turning, because it does seem like what they're going to do. And I'm going to tell you about that now in a sec because I pulled off something off their actual official website. But I do think maybe there's other things they can do so that the stadium isn't turned into like a Swiss army knife, if you like, right? Mm. Where, the football is the main purpose, but you have go car and ab sailing, this, that, and the other, right? And God knows what else. You start about. to forget what the what the real function of it yeah, is. Yeah, you start yeah. to forget what the real function of it is, right? It's like a Swiss Army knife. For as you started off as Ben, is it a knife? Yeah, is it a scissor? Yeah, got, I know what you're yeah, saying. You've got scissors, screwdriver, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So for me, I wonder if there's anything else they can do and just leave the football stadium as a football stadium, like the Great White Hart Lane was. Now. 
Um, another point I want I want to bring up as well is um, I've got two more on this, and and or oh, actually, so I want to go into what they said on the um, on their actual website. And um, so, just give me a second, I'll get that up. So, the terminology that they used on their on the actual Tottenham Hotspur website, which I didn't like to be honest with you, Jack, is London's newest sports and entertainment destination. This is, uh, like I said, off the official sports website. For me, it does seem like Enix vision for Tottenham in the future, that it's no longer going to be football. It's going to be what they said, an entertainment and London's newest sports destination. That concerns me a little. It's sort of maybe gets me thinking that that is their sole purpose and they're not focused directly on the football like many fans are accusing them of, which is what they should be focusing on now because I'm of the belief. I fell in love with Tottenham Hotspur, a football club. And for me, if everything is right on the football pitch and in the football structure in terms of the academy, the scouting network, and we're winning on the football pitch, by all means, you know, do all the other side stuff as long as you can keep us and it's keeping us competitive. But when you're not competitive on the football pitch, the way fans want you to be, and then you see that, they wonder why fans get angry, right? Mm, that's a good point you make there, Dave. Um, I know you have some other points to go to, but I know you also have a tinfoil hat moment, maybe with a certain jam Najafi that maybe we could bring up as well. But I know you have some other points to get to. Yeah, I'm just going to get to this other point quickly. And it's just... Again, I don't think the people inside the club get it, right? It's just more poor sort of PR communication to the fan base, which is their biggest problem. Fans yeah. feel disconnected from Daniel Levy, from Meaning, that they never really know what's going on, that they're always up to say this, but they're always up to something shady. And that's because their communication, their PR to the fans is poor and it feels like that they feel to me because this is something that has been in the works for a long time you'd have to get plan and permission to build underneath the south stand etc right you know it would have been talked about a long time ago and it's like so it would have been signed sealed and delivered quite like you know before before today for instance but they held it back because we were losing and knew that mm. uh, they knew they'd get a massive reaction right but they think just because we've won two london derbies they think it's okay to sort of come out and announce it. And it's like, again, they just don't understand what the fans' frustration is. It's like, Tone yes, winning, but the fans' frustration is like we've won the last two games. But in general, the fans' frustration is, Jack, you know, the football on the pitch. You know, still having, uh, you know, we still, we still have a long way to go in the transfer market to make us yeah. more competitive on the pitch. The scouting department, the youth facilities, not producing enough youth players through the academy, right? You know, these are all the fans' major problems and they never seem to really address that or understand that. And I'm just baffled that they think because we've won two London derbies, it sugarcoats everything and all them problems are gone away. And they think it's a good time to put it out there and they're going to get praised for it. That yeah. sort of baffles me. But look, that's all I'm going to say on that. Have you anything you want to say on them? And then No, I, I think you brought up a lot of good points there. I think I expressed what I really needed to say. I think there were so many different avenues that we brought up here. It really is actually quite a, a complex subject. And hopefully we felt like it served some justice to you. But it did feel like, Dave, maybe too, it was just... A slightly a bit tone deaf, let's be honest, like after, yes. you know, maybe the, the London derbies. So I can see, I don't like see it as tone deaf as maybe other people do, but believe me, like I'm not going to defend them on it. Like I could totally vouch for why people could see it as, you know, a bit yeah. tone deaf after these London derbies and also like a bit like, geez, you know, getting out of yourself, are we? Uh, kind of, uh, mm. kind of, you know, moment too, right? So I could totally understand that. Yeah. Totally yeah. Understand that. Jam Najafi, or yeah, yeah, you were going to say also. Yeah, I, just, I know you have a tinfoil hat, you know, kind of moment. Put on your no, tinfoil no, hat, yeah. everybody. Yeah, look, I'll put, I'll put it on loud and proud here. Um, Jam Najafi owns McLaren F1 racing team. Now, uh, look, this could go two ways. All the stuff we see with Jam Najafi could be to do with this Formula One sponsorship we're seeing now, or it just makes buying Tottenham more appealing to Jan the Jaffe than ever before because of this and because of his ownership of McLaren F1 racing. I wonder is is 
the sponsorship today anything to do with the Jan the Jaffe takeover, Jack? I think it, it's hard to say it doesn't, but it's also hard to say, like, it, it, coincidence, maybe not, but at the same time, how much does it really benefit Jam Najafi? You can only speculate because he seems to be a guy that probably is very interested in the various revenue streams, kind of like how Daniel Levy is, right? He himself is invested in a variety of different sports revenue streams, Jam Najafi, because he's connected to that MSP uh, sports capital or whatever it is too, right? And so he is, you know, a guy that is well-versed and, you know, making money in a variety of different ways, you know, through sport, through sponsorships, through all that kind of stuff. And it does seem like maybe if he's already well-invested in a Formula One, if he's already kind of knee-deep in that sort of game, why not maybe make it a bit easier on him? Maybe perhaps get a better relationship with the likes of the Formula One team. Just put his, you know, put himself even further into it, almost as well as kind of a win win scenario where he is already interested in the likes of Tottenham Hotspur, his associates, as well as the other people from that, I don't know, con you know, congregation or, you know, sort of conglomerate, right, that are going in for it. Uh, the coalition, what would you say, of investors that are going into it? Maybe is sort of kind of as a win-win scenario for him if uh, Formula One is also having a relationship uh, with Spurs. But I, would also, I would also add to that, Jack, even if he doesn't buy Tottenham, I wonder will he invest to look to own the whole go-kart and experience for the F1 McLaren team as the home of like trying to produce young tri drivers, bring them through this, that and the other. So, so How much are Spurs for paying for it? Yeah, is the question. It opens up to a number of teams, really. It'd be very interesting to see how this pans out and something maybe we should keep a close eye on. I think it is something we should keep a close eye on for sure. Um, but everybody, I think we're going to leave that sort of, you know, topic there. Maybe just uh, anybody, please, please, please hit the like button on that, especially if you did enjoy that discussion as well. Leave your comments down below on anything you might agree with, of course, as well as disagree with, because I know there are a variety of different opinions, and I do think they all are valid when it comes to Daniel Levy, when it comes to Enoch, and when it comes to the future of Tottenham Hotspur, because we all want the same thing. And we all are trying to interpret, you know, kind of difficult things at the same same time you know as well here when it comes to the likes of spurs to everybody so we all want the same thing like i said so please 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 leave your comments down below agree or disagree whatever it may be hit that like button too please also as well if you did enjoy that discussion but dave i think also as well maybe we were to maybe sort of segue into kind of a a wind down you know kind of conversation of the likes of um I don't know, maybe Region. Should we talk about maybe a left wing back that could maybe come back to us? And I think we're going to, you know, end it off after that, everybody. But I still think this is worth paying attention to, everybody, because Dave and I really like Region. And, you know, we do probably have to look at a new left wing back, I think, this summer. Perisic has been struggling, you know, defensively. He's struggling to show that he can really cut it at left wing back at the Premier League level. Let's be honest, Sassion has become practically utterly useless uh, recently, not looking good uh, going forward or looking good defensively. Also, just as, I mean, despite not being good, is also just really injury prone too. He's barely available. It seems like this most recent injury while being kind of a, a heartbreak, I imagine for him is just, you know, another injury, just, it's just another injury. And so it does make you question, do Spurs actually need another left wing back? And the likes of Atletico Madrid do not seem keen actually on signing uh, Sergio on a, on a permanent. They are going to maybe be looking at other left wing backs or other left backs this summer, Dave. So if Sergio Regulon will be coming back to the club this summer. Maybe we'll be looking to move him on, or maybe could we be looking to keep him? And maybe we could save some money on a new left wing back via Sergio Regulon. Yeah, look, many people are saying, you know, with, with, with Perisic not really working out, we need to sign a, left, a new left wing back. But, you know, I don't think that's the case, Jack. I think you'll agree with me on this that. Look, Ben Davies, I don't think, is the long-term solution. He's done a job for the last couple of games, but, you know, some of the bad performances for me, the damage is done, and that's always going to be there with Ben Davies. So, for me, he's not the long-term solution there, although it's working out now. Seth Young, I've said for quite some time, I just don't think the guy's good enough defensively or going forward. And I do believe the only reason why he was kept is because he's English and he helps towards the homegrown quarter. Um, and that's why Reglan was ending up being shipped out to make way for Perisic, right? Um, but look, you've got a Doji coming in this summer. Um, a lot of fans, you know, been keeping an eye on him. Really, really like him. Really like what he's about. Um, and for me, yeah. 
you know, I don't think you need to go and waste money on that position. I think we had a perfectly decent one there in Regulon. I like what he's about. I think he was decent defensively. I think he was good going forward as well. I think he offers a lot more than Cessio. I think he offers a lot more than Ben Davies. Definitely has the energy and the pace to get up and down like Emerson on the other side. And for me, I think it's a win-win. I think you bring him in and you keep him. If you, and if that means you have to register an Alfie yeah. Whiteman as a third-choice goalkeeper or register a youngster and, and you know, to replace Cess Young as an ongoing own um, situation, yeah. I don't care. For me, you know, it's money you yeah. could save and you pump into your centre-back, which is a real issue. Let's be honest, everybody. We have a whole host of positions that we need to upgrade as well as fill and remove players from in order to get players into. It's just so much that needs to be done, I think, this summer. And it feels like left wing back, sadly, is still something that's still left, you know, not fully resolved, not fully done and completed. Like maybe the right wing back position, you could say at this moment in time, considering Emerson's form, considering Poro coming into, you would feel more confident I think right now in the right wing back spot, as well as Jad Spence, right? Still on loan and the likes of, uh, then you would say the left wing back position. And so it does make you probably question like Spurs need what three center backs, maybe this summer, they need a new goalkeeper to replace Lloris. Of course, they still need, I think some midfield upgrades, maybe two per, potentially some players to add to the forward line. And then maybe now when you look at it too, left wing backs are probably going to have to be looked at. And would you rather maybe, go for a big, you know, uh, sort of player to compete with the likes of Udogi, or do you maybe just go for somebody that you can save a bit of money on that you still know is good enough to compete at a sort of a level that can make Udogi look over his shoulder as well as other players playing in that position look over their shoulder? And to be honest, I think Regulon kind of fits that bill. I've always had a bit of a soft spot for the guy like you have, Dave. I've always thought he had a very good cross on him wherever he could pick people out. Felt like he could hit people, you know, on the floor, you know, kind of played along the carpet. Or he could also, you know, put in a big loop and cross with a bit of heat on it as well. I think he had a really good motor on him, kind of like Emerson, Dave, where I feel like he could get up and down really well like Emerson does. I think he's actually quite pacey too, Regulon. Like, believe me, there was a few times where it felt like he is kind of one of the pacier guys on the pitch. And I don't think he's really as bad of a defender nearly as Perisic or Sess, you know, and he's not like a great defender, like I would say a Romero is, or even Emerson is, but I think he's kind of like a little terrier where he's quite feisty as well as I just don't think he gets done as much as other defenders like Perisic and Sessignon do. So that would, I think, be an improvement. And he didn't seem to really have all that bad of an attitude or personality. He seemed to get along with the rest of the dressing room <laughs> as much as Dave and I really did not like watching the, you know, the guys, you know, having the cricket games and whatnot. Regulon was a part of the cricket games. He seemed to get along with people who's playing Call of Duty with the boys and all that sort of stuff. He seemed like a guy that's kind of people got along with, but sort of fell victim to homegrown issues as well as maybe just not really cutting it towards the end of the season, I think. But I actually ultimately have always thought that Regulon has been better than Sassion, and Sassion ultimately hasn't taken advantage of his opportunity when given it to him. Sassion was given a lot of faith, a lot of chances, just hasn't taken them. And Maybe we could look at saving a bit of cash here and going after the likes of Regulon. But if you think that's a little ridiculous, do let me know, everybody. Feel free to disagree with me. That's just how I see it. I'd be happy to see Reggie come back. Got a bit of a, a theory. and I think I'm sort of loosely spot on with this. I think when I look at it, right, <coughs> Regulon sort of started coming out of the team last February, last, last, last January, last February. I think it was the Wolves game I was over there for when – um um we lost 2-0 to Wolves Correct. um under Conte. That was February. Regulon sort of started coming out of the team and Session was favoured all of a sudden. Now I think the reason why that was Perisic was coming out of contract. I think they already knew they were getting Perisic and Science had delivered. And I think that Conte was told, you know, well, you're gonna whether even though you want Regulon, you're gonna have to use Session because we have a whole role quote we need to meet. So Conte then started trying to prepare Session. It clearly hasn't worked out. But he's had to accept it because Perisic was his guy and Regulon had to be shipped on. Now, for me, like I said, get you don't back. believe that Conte and Regulon not. ever like butted heads nope. or anything like that. Yeah, no, nope. I hard. think it was purely the fact that Perisic was his guy. He's what he wanted there because every manager wants a player that he's managed previously to come in so that people, it helps them get the ideas across their players, 
gives him someone to get feedback or talk to, or what other players are thinking of his training sessions, him, how, you know, this, that, and the other, right? It's sort of like his eyes and ears in the dressing room and reports back to him. Every manager wants one of them. It helps him translate himself across to the playing squad. I thought already at Tottenham a lot quicker through someone like Perisic. And the way I see it is when I look at it, when I see Reglan starting to come into the team, Reglan out of the fold. Because for me, I thought Reglan was always better than Sessio. Yeah. I thought he got forward a lot more. I thought he got into the box. My biggest problem was, is when the ball came across to him in the box, the guy wouldn't hit a barn door with a bulldozer. But he gets down the wing, he crosses, he's at leg, he gets stuck in defensively, and he was all action. He wanted to try and do the right thing. So for me, like you said, Jack, I don't think it was that he put ahead with Conte. I don't think it that it, I don't think it's like that, it, that he was a problem. I think that he seen Winks was Quite a problem, so he realized Winks had to go out. So he had to keep Session for homegrown, and that's what he was told. So he had to go with it. But I would like to see them fit Reglan back into the squad this season. Especially because, well, like easy. we brought up before, left wing back is going to have to be addressed. And are Spurs going to really buy another left wing back? I really doubt it. So I think they could probably look at maybe bringing a guy back on loan. But Dave, I mean, we had a good, good discussion today on the likes of the Formula One. Uh, we got a little palate cleanser, I think, with a uh, Regulone here as well. But might just leave it there, I think, for everybody, don't you think? You know, and uh, just sort of have everybody. Uh, yeah, Dave, sorry. Sometimes these things have to come with a warning. I'm going to put that out there. The thumbnail was for a bit of a laugh. In no way do my mommy and Jack excited about go go karting. No way, or, you know, or anything like that. It was simply just a bit of a laugh, a bit of a play on the situation. So hopefully people enjoyed the thumbnail as a bit of a joke and don't take it seriously or literal or anything like that because we know that can sort of happen from time to time. So... Let's not let that happen. It's only a joke. It's a bit of fun and a bit of play on what's going on right now. That's all it is. And anybody, if you want to support the channel, support the podcast, support the daily content that we put out for you guys, feel free as well to just hit that join link. It's right next to the subscribe uh, this, to the subscribe button. If you haven't hit that already, hit that join link. Join the Flat Cap Army. There's a Flat Cap membership just to support the channel with all the daily content we bring out there. Fan show membership, of course, as well. If you would like to come on to nearly 20 plus fan shows that we do a month as well, everybody. So if you do want to support the channel as well, feel free to hit that membership. It would be a great way to support us and everything that we do over here. But like I said before, hit that like button, please, on the way out. Let's get to 100 likes if we can. But as always, and you know, regardless of Levy in, Levy out, whatever it is, Come on, you Spurs. Come on, you Spurs. In Conte, I trust. And I will be we'll seeing you. Seeing Dave will be seeing tomorrow. you. Tomorrow. Bye, tomorrow. everybody. Sheffield United, come on. Come on. Everywhere we go. Yes.